guess what? We are going to conclude Acts chapter 27, which means there is one more chapter left. One more, Acts 28. And so uh, you all have journeyed well on this uh, well over a year as we went through this very, very pivotal Bible, uh, a Bible, pivotal book in the Bible of, of how the Holy Spirit just took off and, and catapulted the church and the gospel to ends of the earth and that we're still living in that same call right now today. Uh, and so I thank you for being a part of that. And, and we are today looking at the second part of, of Paul's little uh, Gilligan Island trip here in terms of his boat and, and it's about to rip apart and he's in an impossible situation. And so as we look at this and open this up today, I ask you all, have you ever been in impossible situations? Impossible situations, situations where there, you lost hope and you thought there is just no way that this is going to turn out well, that I have no idea what's happening. It's just too impossible for me to handle. Raise your hand if you've ever been in one of those situations. And some of you may be like, I don't even want to raise my hand. It's too, it's too hard to even raise my hand to even think about the situations like that. Impossible situations happen for all of us, ranging from cancer diagnoses and, uh, and, and uh, deeper situations, death in the family, things like that, to... Um, to situations that I'm going to share here today, uh, the one that came to my mind was um, losing my job, my first ministry experience. I was a youth minister in, in Florida, youth director, and was just about to graduate from seminary. I had just married Carrie, and we were expecting the, our, 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 our first pregnancy, which I shared last week, ended in a miscarriage. And so right around that same time, I think we found out in November we were pregnant, and the week later maybe, something like that, I forget the timeline, I got the uh, called in and was told that my job was no longer going to be full-time and that they were going to reduce it to uh, part-time, 20 hours a week, which meant no more benefits, and it meant our total loss of, of basically primary income at the time. And I'm thinking, we just got pregnant. What, what's going to happen? And, and by the grace of God, you know, I'm talking about impossible situations, a job opened up teaching. How many of you remember what kind of teacher I was? Raise your hand. Do you remember what it was? What was it? English, right. Well, this teaching job was teaching math, of all things. So if you want to <laughs> talk about impossible situations, that was it. But I had no income coming in. And of course, they're like, we have a job for you. Can you teach math? I said, yes, I can. Absolutely. Sure could. As long as you give me an answer key, we can whip young minds into shape. It felt very impossible. There were mounting bills to pay. When we got married, I brought into the marriage a car payment, a mortgage, massive credit card debt, and student loan payments that were six figures in numbers. So I don't know why my father-in-law said yes, but he did to having me marry his daughter after an hour and a half conversation, but I digress. We had all those bills. I had no more health insurance. Luckily, Carrie still did through, through her, her job that she had. And we needed a new bed. Our bed was uncomfortable. She was pregnant and it was hurting her back. And so we needed to, to get that under control. And that was another $1,500 bill on all that. How in the world was this going to happen? But by the grace of God, we pulled through. All the bills got paid on time. There was no major health events for me. And we bought the bed and still had money left over. It's insane how that worked. God shows up in the impossible. And not just for money and provision, but also in protection, in overcoming hurdles, in deliverance, and in peace. I said at the first service, don't ever disregard or discount the prayer for peace. And don't ever pray it lightly. Peace is so important for folks because sometimes that is the only thing that's going to get them through that impossible situation, the assurance of God's hand and comfort on their life. We are in an impossible situation with Paul right now. He is on a ship. He just pronounced to the ship's crew on his way to Rome. It's about to be torn apart. He's got this divine revelation that, hey, the ship's going to bust apart, but don't worry. Take heart. We're all going to be fine. You got to stay with me. Everything is going to be well. The God in whom I serve has told me so. And it begs the question for me, at least this is the one that came to my mind, why does God so often work in impossible situations? Why does it always feel like as we read through Scripture, or even in our own life, that the situation has to get dire and feel impossible before He shows up and shows out? Now, those of you who have ever been pulled through 
impossible situations, and you look back, you realize that what I just said is not exactly true, that he showed up right on time, and that he was always there through it. But in the midst of the waves crashing around, sometimes, sometimes we don't see that. I think of Lazarus when he died, and Jesus waited until he was good and dead before he showed up. But he showed up just at the right time. Why does God do this? Well, because he's not in the business of elevating us and saying, look how great this person is and how they pulled through. He is in the business of taking his witnesses and pulling him through by his power so that it's not our name and our greatness and our strength of faith, but his that people see. We are just ambassadors, my friends. We're just conduits. You know what a conduit is? You just let it flow. We are just conduits. We are a holy priesthood who just points back to the Lord and says, He, He is the one who is great. He is the great one true God. See, God acts and decrees and intervenes for one purpose, that His name is known above all other names, so that all who believe and trust in that name may be reconciled to Him. So today, the ship breaks. The ship that Paul's on is going to get torn apart, and the impossible happens. They all have to make for the beach. Some can swim, some can't, but they all make it there. And this isn't for Paul's greatness, as I have already said, but it is to the glory of God alone. So today, this is, this is the thing I want you to walk out singing and praising after hearing this message. To God be the glory. Say that. Very good. Very, he did that wonderfully. Let's open up Acts chapter 27, verses 27 through 44. We're going to dive into this, and let's see where we're at, okay? So in the Pew Bibles, pages 1113 and 1114, uh, let's open it up. Look at Acts chapter 27, verses 27 and following. He's just had the divine decree. He has just said, everyone, stay with me. You're going to be fine. The God in whom I'm served has appeared to me tonight and has told me these things. We're all going to be great. So here we are, Acts chapter 27, verse 27 through 44, this impossible situation. When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. Now again, remember, dark, can't quite see, but they're suspecting that they're coming close. So they take a sounding, a measurement, and found 20 fathoms. Now they're measuring the depth of the water. And a little further on, they took a sounding again and found it was 15 fathoms. So what does that mean? That it's getting more shallow, which means they are approaching land. And fearing that we might run onto the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern, and they prayed for the day to come. Now, I circled that because isn't that interesting? These sailors, this ragtag group of sailors who are Gentiles, Pagan worshiping people, whom to whom are they praying to that are going to slow this ship down? And in my research and all the smart commentator people, they said you probably can understand that they're most likely praying to their pagan gods. This is what they would do. They would call out to whomever God that they could call out to and be like, please save us. What do we need to do to get saved? So they prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape, from the ship, they had lowered the ship's lifeboat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow. Now, somehow, Paul sees this going on and realizes that this is odd that they're going to lay more anchors down. We've already laid the anchors down. Why are they laying more anchors down? And realizes that they are trying to escape. And so what the sailors are thinking is like, you all can stay here with Paul and to the God in whom he serves, we're out of here. It's kind of like the Titanic where they didn't have enough lifeboats. They only had a knife for the select few. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to leave Leo and Kate on that boat. That's what they were doing. Paul said to the centurion and to the, to the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and they, they let it go. Well, and that's something. Basically, what they just did was they sealed everyone's fate. Okay? We're not getting off. No one else is either. And so we're either going to ride this thing out or the God in whom Paul serves is going to show up. As the day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. Underline that. It'll give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. He doubles down on that divine decree. And when he said these things, he took bread 
and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. And they were all encouraged and ate some food for themselves, all 276 of them. What does that sound like? Communion, very good, right? And so I, I, I also said this at the first service too, not that it matters, I don't know why I keep saying that, but I keep saying it anyways. But when he took the bread, I thought communion, very much so, right? So I go and I study this because I'm thinking this is going to be, this is the thing I'm going to preach on today, isn't this great? But all the smart commentator people are saying that we're not supposed to look to this as a communion feast, it's not a fellowship of believers. It's all Gentile people. There's no cup. There's no wine. And this is customary in, in, the, in Jewish custom for as you start a meal, to give thanks to God, to break bread, and begin to eat. But I can't go there. Little old dumb me from Gordon-Conwell Seminary. You know, some of our pastors went to Princeton. Wonderful. But I went to Gordon-Conwell down in Jacksonville, Florida, the seminary of Bubba. And... Uh, and study this, and I'm like, I can't go there. This looks like communion to me. Even though it's not believers, and even though it's not how the communion that we understand, they are receiving the same things that we receive from when we take communion, strength and encouragement. I don't know where it's going to lead to, but I know Luke also writes when they talk about Jesus and the walk to Emmaus and uses the same language. After giving thanks, he took bread and he broke it. I think there's something deep here that, that bears looking into. So let's put that in your cap. So let's finish this out. They throw the grain from the ship now. So they've been strengthened by this food. They, they get rid of all the food. They've got no provisions left on the boat. Now when it's day, they did not recognize land, but they did notice a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors. So they cut all the anchors away because now they want speed. And they left them in the sea at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders that was also slowing them down. They cut all of that away. All that's left now is them and the ship. And hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, which is a sandbar. So if any of you have been to Florida, I, of course, used to live there. There is something called a sandbar, which is a piece of land that separates the body of water, then another, some water, and then the actual land. Well, they hit this. They hit that reef. And they run the vessel aground. The bow struck and remains immovable. The stern's being broken up by the surf. And the soldiers now plan to kill all the prisoners because they can connect the dots. This ship is going to break apart just like Paul said. But if we lose any of these, any of these prisoners, it's our heads that are going to be cut off. So we're going to kill these prisoners, including Paul. But the centurion wishing to save Paul kept them from carrying out their plan. And he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard and first make for the land, and the rest of them on planks or pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. And I would add, just as God decreed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so we can look at this story and think, oh, great how Paul, look how great Paul is. Look at his wonderful faith. Look at how steadfast he, he did, and he got everyone to shore. But there is a bigger, grander picture that is happening with this story and ultimately what happens with the entire book of Acts. We are not supposed to look at this wonderful person as wonderful as he is, but we are to look at the glory and the sovereignty of God in making sure that what he said he is going to do, he's going to deliver. He is going to do that. And so let's look at it. Let's, let's see what's happening here. Remember I said that the whole um, Eucharist thing that's there, the, the communion on the ship, and it being a deeper teaching. Well, what God, I think, is doing is he's, show, he's showing out. He's showing off. Because this is an old habit for the Lord. To show up in impossible situations and work through impossible people to get his will to be done. So we have Paul on a boat, right? And he's given the soldiers, the people on the boat, an opportunity to obey. What did he say? He said, Listen, you have to stay with the boat. And it's an opportunity to obey what he said and put their trust in the God in whom he serves. Then he breaks bread, gives thanks, and then they have, they have this meal that's there. What's the meal for? For strength and encouragement to get them through the journey ahead. And what is the journey ahead? Ultimate deliverance. To be delivered out of this storm, this situation, and be saved. It reminds me so much of where communion comes from. 
the Passover feast. And if you go back to the Old Testament in the book of Exodus, you remember the Israelites. They are now in bondage. They are under Egyptian rule. Moses, a prophet, is raised up, just like Paul, prophet who's raised up. And Moses is sent to go to the people and to say, say to them that one of the plagues that God's going to do is strike down all of the firstborn out through all of Egypt, which would include the Israelites too, lest they do this one thing. Here's an opportunity to obey. They are to make a sacrifice and take the blood and paint it on the doorpost of their, of their doors. And that way, when the angel of the Lord passes over, they will pass over that house knowing, up, oh, this is a chosen person and the firstborn gets to live. But not only that, it was not only just an invitation to obey. What else did God tell them to do? Old Testament 101. He said, make the sacrifice, but then eat it. Eat the meat. Eat everything in the house so that they have what? Strength. And that they would be encouraged for the journey that awaits them, which is obviously to go through the Red Sea and, and, and be delivered from Egypt. You see the connections between the two. Paul gave them an opportunity to obey, gave them food for strength, and they were delivered for it. Moses gave them an opportunity to obey. He had food to give them strength, and they were delivered for it. Is this so that Moses and Paul can be the great somebody? No, it's so that everyone can see who the one true creator, savior, God is. This was for Pharaoh's and Egypt's benefit, and of course the Jews as well. And this was for the Gentiles' benefit so that they can see the God in whom Paul serves is the legit true God. Those who they were praying to ain't going to do a ding-dong thing. But you stay with the boat. You stay with the God in whom Paul serves, and you will be delivered. Isn't that great? Isn't that something? This is not for them. It's, it's for something bigger. It's for the glory of the Lord to God be the glory. Even more of God showing out here in this little scene there's another Old Testament story that is even stronger than the Passover connection. This is how God continues to prove that he is the same today as he was yesterday and as he will be tomorrow. The Old Testament story is the story of Jonah. Anyone remember Jonah? So Jonah, also a prophet. Jonah was raised up. Paul says to, or Paul, goodness gracious. God says to Jonah, you need to go to Nineveh. Tell, this, tell these people they're being horrible so that if they repent, everything's going to be great. Jonah's like, mm, nope, don't want to do it. And so he boards a boat and tries to escape the call of God. And the first chapter of Jonah says, well, then a tempest, a storm raises up on this boat. And all the sailors that are on the boat begin to jettison things off. They throw off the tackle, the gear, the food, all the things. And then they begin to look around and be like, which one of you is anger to God? And they're looking around. And Jonah, very, who's actually, I think, asleep, I think the story goes, they wake him up and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's probably me. <laughs> you, know, I, <laughs> you probably, I, probably the best thing for you to do is just throw me off the ship at this point. I mean, where does Jonah's mind have to be that he's like, the only way it's going to save you is if you throw me off this boat. Throw me off the boat into the sea and you'll be fine. Well, the sailors at first were like, ah, that seems harsh, but why would you anger your God? Why would you do that? Do whatever you need to do to get it right. Of course, nothing happens and the storm continues to rage. And so finally, they throw Jonah off the boat. Heave ho, boom, off he goes, right? And as soon as they do that, storm ceases. And they all make a sacrifice to the one true God and take vows. Paul, unlike Jonah, is obedient. And so his whole thing is we got to stay with the boat. They also throw things off the boat. They're both trying, the boat stories, the, the people are trying to save the vessel and not looking to the bigger picture. And both stories end with God's decree coming to fruition. Both gave the opportunity for Gentiles to see and witness the greatness and the truth of the one true creator and savior God. Jonah's shipmates actually end up, as I said, making those sacrifices. Of course, they throw them off the boat, but I digress. And Paul's, all of his people get to the beach, don't know if there's a conversion there, but it's the same idea. They are saved by God's decree. Now, Jonah obviously gets swallowed up by a whale. He takes a little side street into humility and trust. But inside that whale, he has this prayer. It's the end of chapter 2 and comes to the realization that, oh God, salvation belongs to you. 
In all these accounts, it's not the greatness of the prophet that takes center stage. No, it's the greatness of the one true creator, Savior God. And in his greatness and grace, he works through impossible situations and get this, impossible people. Paul is just a dude He is just a regular guy. I know that we have had conversations before. I've had conversations with people before, both in youth ministry and in in ministry here, that people look at the disciples and Paul and they think, well, they've got it made. They were with Jesus. They have a special ounce of strength that we don't have. There's no way we can do the things that they did. No, they're just dudes. They are just sinful people, just like you and me. And God is using them in those impossible situations so that people don't go, oh, look how great Paul is, but see how great God is. We're to marvel at his transformative power in people, not the people themselves. To God be the glory. The passage continues to teach us not only is Jesus enough, remember I asked you that question a couple weeks ago, is Jesus enough, but it's also that he is worthy and that he simply is. Take from this the moral of the story of of the boat that Jesus is the I am God, that the God in whom Paul serves is the one who is doing all of the delivering, the one who's doing all the protecting. Who are we to ever question Jesus and his plan? We are just servants. We are just ambassadors. Jonah was to go to Nineveh, and Nineveh he got to by way of whale, but he got there. And Paul was to go to Rome, and to Rome he went. God's going to see it through. When all the ship's crew put their faith in everything but God, Paul remains calm, never breaks down, and faces the destruction. He is an Abraham of the New Testament. Do you see that? He is an Abraham of the New Testament, a Noah, a Moses. He's an Isaiah, a Jeremiah, an Ezekiel. He is the very thing (laughs) that God continues to work through. Abraham disobeyed, even though we say his obedience credited him as righteousness. Moses was a murderer, even though he saves a whole bunch of Jewish people. Noah liked the little bottle just a little bit too much, you know? But God works through those impossible people so that we see that he is great. Paul is a great man of faith, sure, and we can celebrate that and follow his example. But this is not the point of Acts. This is not the point of the story. The point is to bear witness to how great God is and who sent his son Jesus, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king. All these earthly prophets are a ragtag bunch of people just trying to do their best. But Jesus, the true prophet, the one in whom God sent to love and save us, who through his Holy Spirit and imperfect people dwells richly within us to empower us to be witnesses in our impossible situations. So that it's not that our greatness is seen so that we may boast, but his. To God be the glory, as it says, for the things he has done. So I bring us back to our question the last two weeks. What is Jesus worth to you? What is your faith and relationship worth to you? Is he enough in your life? Jennifer and I were talking in between these two services, and she came up with even a more powerful question. If you knew that your impossible situations was going to lead someone else to know who Christ is, would it be worth it? Would you go through those situations if it meant somebody else was going to know who he is? Because that's exactly what Christ did and calls us all to do the same. What ships are we desperately trying to preserve in our lives? What problems are we holding on to to try to manufacture an outcome that we can control through our own power rather than giving into God's plan and will? If you're like me, I struggle with this daily. I am a three on the Enneagram, if you know what that is. It's someone who values too much what people think of them. And so daily I struggle with, do they like me? Do they think I'm doing well? Do they like the message that, I'm serv- that I gave? Are my clothes okay? Is everyone okay? It's exhausting. But that's me trying to hold on to the ship that God's trying to rip apart. Because it's not by my power that anything's going to happen here at this church but through His. And if I don't learn that lesson, and if we don't learn that lesson, start looking for the whale. Because that's exactly what Jonah did. Jonah was put in time out. Look at the whale 
as God saying to Jonah, you're in timeout, okay? Because Jonah was thrown into the sea to die. The whale is not punishment. The whale is protection. The whale is protection. And in there, he becomes and realizes that salvation belongs to the Lord. Sometimes our impossible situation is God taking us and putting us in a timeout and saying, woo, woo, you're getting too big for your britches. That's exactly what happened to me when I lost my job. I thought I was the great somebody. My youth ministry was going great. We had over 900 kids weekly coming to the church for an outreach after football games. And I thought, well, and the Lord, boom, busted that down and said, oh, no, sir, this is not on you that this is happening. And how quickly a ministry can be taken. Time out, the whale. My friends, we are just mere servants. That's all we are. That's all Paul was. That's all the disciples were. We're called to let the grace and power of the Lord flow through us and to point to his greatness always. That's what a priest means. The scriptures call us a holy priesthood of believers. Priest means to stand in the gap between sinful humanity and the greatness of God and to point and say, that's where it's at. That's where you find salvation. That's where you find peace. That's where you find redemption. In this life, the ships are going to break. The lifeboats are going to burn. The safety ropes are going to cut. Penn State's going to lose. <laughs> My one Penn State fan. But we stand in the gap and we point. To God be the glory, now and forever, always, and amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, I thank you again for impossible situations, which seem so hard to thank you for. For there are some of us that are in deep, impossible situations where the light and the hope is all but gone. Lord, remind us that in those situations, you are in the valley with us, walking with us, guiding us, leading us through. And that this situation then can become a means of a story, a testimony, a, a ray of hope for someone else to see how you pulled us through. And that they wouldn't see how great we are, but how great you are, Lord. And that they would desire that above all else. Oh, Paul was wonderful with his faith, dear God, on that boat and that ship and gives us a great example of how to have strong faith. But let us see the bigger story that if you say that you're going to do something, you will see it through so that we all know who the one true creator and savior God is. To God be the glory in Jesus' name, amen. He is worthy of all of our praise. He is worthy of all of our honor. He is worthy of all the glory that he demands and that he makes known. So go now as people who know that glory and know that truth and know the knowledge of the true Savior Jesus. Share that with people who are in impossible situations. Share with them that there is a Savior, the Savior, who will see them through to the beach. Even everything breaks apart, he will get them there. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Have a great weekend, everybody.